I'll come back. No. Um, so we have now um, section 24, which is going to be focused on like data, uh, data generation, resampling. Uh, we probably won't have time to go into Monte Carlo, um, which is kind of a really cool aspect. Um, fun fact, um, my bachelor's thesis, it's not really a fun fact, it's my, it's my fact. Um, I did Monte Carlo uh, for my bachelor's thesis to uh, simulate um, particle spins and stuff like that. So um, something that was really fun. And I'll just kind of put this in here because I think it's really funny. I was looking at like, you know, I think there's a really good thing I can explain in here. And oh no, what's it? Oh, it's not in here. Sorry, everyone. There was a paper. Um, okay, so I went to go search like, oh, I really want to see if there's a good explanation of jackknife versus boots, um, bootstrap for resampling. And the funny thing is that I found this paper, the first thing I found was this re someone said, oh, you should read this paper, like on a comment. And this is actually my professor um, back uh, when I was in uh, uh, Santa Cruz. So I was like, oh, I remember this paper. So he goes, you can see there's really a lot of math in here, but I thought that was pretty fun. Um, so anyway, I really like these so subjects, but um, know that we'll go more into this. But uh, first thing is data generation, because it's kind of like, well, why do we need to do gen data generation? So has anyone got an idea why would we use data generation? Does anyone know what data generation is? I mean, if you have like a small sample size, right, you might use it to increase the sample size. Yeah, that's exactly right. So like if you have a small sample size, you want to be able to generate through your data. Um, data is expensive to collect usually. Um, I mean, it's, once you have it, it's relatively cheap because you have it. But like to go to the process of collecting that data, like you saw like web scraping, APIs, it's a huge slog just to just try to get the data. So. Sometimes it might be easier or cheaper to actually just generate the data based on what you already have. Um, it's also super quick because we have com computers that can do a really good job of generating this information. Um, note that we also want our data to be realistic, um, which means random, okay? And what I mean by this, um, I once saw this really good example that someone kind of talked about, like, what does it mean by we want our data to be random and realistic, is that if you told a computer to make um, a, a data that's in a parabola shape, um, the computer might just draw like, you know, say like, this is this graph, and it might just draw like, this is the shape it should go. It will just draw points directly on the parabola. But we know realistically, that's not what data looks like, right? Data is messy. So we need to add some, a little bit of randomness in there. So we get more points that are kind of a little off. Like sometimes it hits it, but sometimes it's a little off over here. Sometimes you have an outlier and that's more realistic. Um, and this is what we have to make sure is that when we do our generation, we don't just make a perfect data set because you need to have this. Um, I once was at a, a talk with a Google, or not Google's, um, Uber, Uber, yeah, can't talk, Uber's um, advanced technology group. And they were talking about self-driving cars. And one thing they have, they had a lot of data on self-driving cars, a lot of stuff like uh, pictures and stuff like this. And they talked about how they have this huge amount of data, but it's not enough, they need more. And so what they have to do is data generation. Well, the problem is they have to make sure their data is more realistic. If they just make it perfectly exact, like copies of what they had before, it's not gonna be trainable. Like it's gonna be perfectly overfit on that data they collected and nothing else. So for example, if you have people who are not quite obeying the street laws and stuff like that, you wanna account for those things, even if you haven't seen it yourself. Um, so that's kind of an interesting part is like why you would do data generation. Um, again, uh, Tara said, but if you have a small amount of data, um, generating more. Also, you might want to generate rare data. So things that almost never happen. So again, like going back to that Uber thing, if you want your car to avoid someone jumping in front of a car, right? That's probably an ideal situation. You don't want to hit someone if possible, um, whether they did an accident or on purpose or whatnot, right? But the thing is, is that in all likelihood, you probably won't record that specific data set. Like you're not going to find someone just driving around your car to collect this information um, and find someone who's going to jump in front of it. That's probably not going to happen. So this is where you do data generation to say, well, what would this look like? Or, you know, like, how do I make sure to have this? And this is actually related to uh, simulations in Monte Carlo. You can actually use sometimes simulations to do things that you haven't seen yet. So yeah, so this is some reasons why we do these things. Okay, so comes down to some coding examples. Ooh, yeah. So this actually comes mostly from the curriculum. Um, I think I might have modified it a little bit, but I'm just kind of showing you guys some examples. Uh, you can just kind of ignore what this is going on. It's just Python. It's plotting data. It's a function that's going to take in x data, y data, that's our x, y coordinate. We're only going to be working two dimensions. Um, we're going to do colors as basically each group is going to be its own color. So this is where this is going to come in. And then um, we're just basically making our data frame. We're grouping it by its label. So we're saying, okay, if it's group A, B, or C, 
we're going to color those different colors. Um, so this key right here is going to be that label. And those colors are going to be used based on that key. So group zero, group one, group two, group three. Okay? And it's going to put those all together. So it's going to plot out all of group zero, all of group one, all group two, and so on. Okay, so that's what this function's going. And I think it's once you see it, it's like, okay, I understand what's going on. All right, so the first part is just getting some random uh, data. So this is where this blobs is, right, um, from sklearn. sklearn is a really popular uh, package, which I realized I did not import yet. Oh, okay, what, I needed that package anyway. So make sure you get this part. And sklearn, uh, we're gonna do data sam set sample generator. Um, Sorry, I, I realized I skipped over a part, but we'll see this part is to make blobs. Um, so basically this generated some information to basically have uh, four different centers, four, two different features, and now we can go ahead and plot this. And so basically you can see here, like you see four different centers, basically how many different groups there are. And you see the blue data, the red data, the green data, the yellow data. So this is where we can do it. And I read on this again, new features, and you can see some new data. So these are different blobs and stuff. Okay, um, note that it's not perfectly, it's not perfect all in the same spot. Basically, there's a center and um, different features and it's going to try to figure out, you know, just randomly this little bit of noise. Um, I kind of skipped over one part. So one thing we might want to do is make data that's specific to test out how well our prediction actually is going to do. So um, I wanted to show this graph is from S um, scikit-learn. Um, and so scikit-learn and sklearn, they're related to each other. And so you can see here, we'll see a few of these examples. Um, note that each column is a different type of algorithm to classify, to identify the different colors are represented, like what the algorithm thinks is the right group. So you can see here, basically, this algorithm says everyone in orange is one group, everyone in blue is another group. But you can probably tell if I just made this all grayscale, you would probably instinctively said, well, this inner circle is a separate group than this outer circle out here, right? Same thing like this is um, this kind of like moony shape, right? You can see here is like this moon shape. These are probably two separate groups by itself. Um, interestingly, like this is a good example, is that this data set right here, this doesn't have a clear group. This might make sense for it to be its own thing. So these are different algorithms and you can see the different data generation shapes. These are all generated data and seeing how well they perform. So you can see here some uh, groups do a really good, or some algorithms do really well on this kind of data set. Other groups do really well on this, but maybe poorly on here. Um, other groups, which I like things like this one, D, um, it's always on DB scan. Here's DB scan. DB scan is really good at identifying not groups, but also noise. So you can see these black points. It says, oh, this does not belong to any point. So kind of like outliers. So you can start like basically seeing how these are different from each other and you can see how they perform. This is another reason why you would do data generation to see how well this works. And you can see these algorithms all do really well at identifying these big blobs, but sometimes your data is not gonna look like blobs. Sometimes it's gonna look like these kind of weird different shapes, okay? So um, I'm going to show you how to generate these. So that was our first one is our blobs. Okay. Um, our next one is going to be our making of moons. And this is where I kind of show that, that little moony shape. And so I go write this guy right here. And you can see we have our little moon shape. And you can see, in general, that's what it's supposed to look like. Uh, you'll notice that I have a few parameters in here. Um, there's obviously a lot more that you can use. For example, shuffle, random, I can't, random state. So if you want to generate the same state over and over again. Um, our noise factor obviously is how much noise. Um, what do we think if we gave it like a noise of zero or at least a very, very small noise? What do you think this would look like? Like parabolas? Parabolas, yeah. So you see, that's no noise at all. No noise at all, right? So you can see it's got this very um, strict shape, right? And if we put a lot of noise in here, um, 10 might be a little too much, but we'll see how this looks you'll see that basically it's really hard to tell that um, shape. Basically, it's guessing pretty random. So I think if I just do 0 0.5, I think that's still pretty high. You can still see, you can see in general, like if you knew it was a moon shape, you know that it's kind of like, okay, I can see that overlap kind of there. But for the most part, if I do, for example, 0 0.2, like I had before, you can see that there's still that general shape, but there's definitely some fuzziness with the data. You can see some crossover. Okay, so that's our make moons. Victor, um, like what exactly is noise? Is it related to your standard deviation or like what, what is noise? Yeah, no, good question. Um, I honestly am not quite sure. So if we ever want to know, we can look it up the SK learns data sets. Um, we can see what noise is specifically and you can see noise is our standard deviations like Gaussian noise. So note that it's um, based on the bell curve, right? So how much noise are you actually going to do? I think this is saying uh, standard deviation, meaning it's 0 0.02. Um, how, how far is it from the original shape itself? Okay, cool. Okay. How, how do you pull up the um, documentation like that? I forget. 
yeah, magic, right? Um, so there's a few ways you can do it. Um, one way is like if you're on Jupyter Notebook, you just do shift tab and that pops up. And that usually gives you a quick like what um, parameters are there. So this is why, for example, you should always document your um, function because if you have a doc string, um, you can basically make this come up really easily. And you can say, okay, make two interleaving circ half circles. If that's not enough information, you can just click this up arrow and that will expand completely into here. Um, I don't usually go straight to this um, unless I'm like in the middle of working on something. Usually what I'll do is I'll literally go search sklearn datasets make moons, which um, just to kind of quickly show you guys what that looks like. So you can see here, it's the same information. Um, and sometimes there's examples underneath as well. Um, but you can see here is that it's going to be the same exact information. Usually this is the actual like um, coming directly from the document source. Not every time, depending like stats models varies a little bit on how they um, document stuff. But um, that's a quick way for us to quickly get that information. There's also like the question mark. You guys remember that one too? Because I'm talking about the question mark. You can do that and it'll pop up the same way. Um, the classic example, if you weren't in Jupyter Notebook, is this is this is how I, I remember learning about how to do documentation, doing the help, and it'll print it out. So you can see here. So all of those functions are equivalent. Um, I usually try to go straight to the source because sometimes it's not documented well. So good to know. Cool. All right. Um, yeah, so anyway, I'm going to go to the next part, which are make circles. So as you probably guess, it's going to make some circles, right? So concentric circles in here. And again, you can see, if I do a shift tab, you can see some other things we can have. A factor. Ooh, I wonder what factor does. So we can see here a factor, a scale factor between inner and outer circles. Like, oh, okay, this default is 0.8. So that means it's 80% of the radius of the circle, I think, is what it's trying to say. So if I do a factor of... Let's say like half. So it should be like half its size, right? You can see here the radius is halfway through. And of course, I can add extra noise or less noise. You can start seeing there's a little bit of extra noise in here. And so, yeah, that's our circle and everything like that. Um, what would our shape look like if I increase this value? I don't know. Hopefully, my computer can handle this. But if I increase it to 500 to 5,000, what would our shape become more fuzzy or less fuzzy, you think? Less fuzzy. Less fuzzy. Fatter. Yeah, fatter, right? You can probably see, like, t I think um, this is, might be a leading question, like, what do you mean by fuzzy? Um, it's going to make it the shape more obvious, though, right? Um, if I had, like, 500, an extreme, let's say 50, right? We have this noise. It's not super obvious, especially if I have a lot of noise. Um, you can see it's kind of hard to tell. Um, but as we increase it, I don't know if 5,000 is enough. Um, but you can start seeing there's a basic shape in there. And so we'll still have noise, but it'll be a little bit easier to see. Um, this might not be the best because there's also not, you can't see through the points. So it's kind of hard to tell. I, I think it does the blue afterwards. So that might be why we're seeing blue on top of here. OK, cool. Um, and then our last ones are make regre um, regression. So if you want to test out your regression line, you can actually make um, data that would have some kind of linear regression in here. So I'm actually going to decrease the noise down to a five. And you can see here, this basically say, oh, I have a linear regression line, and it's going to basically put in that extra noise and stuff like this. I uh, know that I also put an alpha in here. Um, that's just so we can see better. So I could have done, uh, I guess I don't have it on here in this plot data. I didn't make this um, function. If I wanted to, I could put maybe like, um, like that. And this function, I believe, comes from the curriculum itself. So just for And then now if I have alpha here, um, let's try like 0 0.5. <laughs> no, that didn't work. Never mind. Anyway, you could do things like alpha and actually change, oh no, what happened? I broke it, okay, cool. So you can see our linear regression here. Um, this is gonna be more relevant when we come into um, our next module when we extend linear regression, but we can actually make um, not just uh, a single line, because that's kind of boring, like, like it's kind of nice and everything, but we might want some extra information that looks like a different shape. 
In this case, we can actually make something like you know a parabola, which is y squared, or um, a cubic function, y cubed in this case. And you can see here, it kind of goes off. And you can, depending on how much um, noise you have, if I have a smaller amount of noise like this, you can see. And this is kind of fun, um, as you can kind of see in general, especially if I have more noise in here. Let's see if I can do a little bit better. I'm trying not to get too much. This might be good. Close enough, I think. OK. So uh, OK. But anyway, one thing I was going to say is that you can see on the extreme ends here um, for this y squared and y cubed is that this will be more extreme. Um, your errors on the outskirts are going to be um, transformed at a higher at a higher rate. So that's why you start seeing like it not approach very well when I did like a very high um, noise level. I think I did like 13, right? That looks closer. So you'll see here, like there's a lot of stuff in the middle here and it's at the end. And the stuff at the end is going to be a lot different. You can kind of see it getting kind of squished down. And it's because basically these parts right here, you can't really tell because of the scaling, but basically these error parts are getting to the power of three. So they're getting emphasized a lot. And that's why you see this basically squished down a lot versus if I had something that was like a very small amount of error, uh, this time pay attention to the scale. If you can see 60,000, you can see here uh, it goes up to, what's that, 1.25? And you can see here, oh, that was 1.25 to the power of, times 10 to the power of seven. So you can see here is that the extreme values don't get as extreme, okay? Well, so that is data generation and how you would uh, perform this part. Um, any questions on using this or why you would use it or anything like that? All right. Yeah, these are really a great ways to like test your algorithm to begin with. Um, this will be re really relevant when we start getting into classification um, into the next couple modules. Um, so kind of pay attention to this part. Um, also, sklearn usually because of a lot of machine learning aspects um, is really useful to generate these stuff, and you can see these comparisons actually being used in some real way. Okay. So, cool.